We're, we're finishing that series today called, called Last Days, and uh, this has been a strong series. Everybody, I've, I've received a lot of feedback on this series, and uh, I just, I just want to also uh, take a moment to welcome those who are, who are joining us online. We're, we're glad that you're with us today. And before I jump into uh, this, this message today, I, I just want to let you know that next week, um, we begin a book study that will last for six weeks. A couple times a year, we focus on books of the Bible or, or chunks of stories. And in fact, the next few months, that's the kind of messages that will be coming here. And so next week, we start a series called Be Free. It's on the book of Galatians, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it, it, the book of Galatians has such, such powerful things for us to know and to remember about the gospel, and uh, I, I want to encourage you, don't miss the start of that next week. In this series, um, uh, in this series, we've been following what the Bible has to say about the last days. It has a lot to say about the last days. In fact, more than a quarter of our Bible is predictive prophecy. The Bible talks a lot about the end of time, and uh, it, it, the Bible has has predictions in, in pretty much every book of, of the Bible. We find predictions about the end. And um, in, 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 in particular, Jesus talked a lot about his own return and about being aware of his return. And, and that's, that's kind of a, it's something that doesn't stop with Jesus. I mean, he talks a lot about it. And then the rest of the New Testament, of course, focuses a great deal on it. In fact, for every prophecy in the Bible that there is for the coming of Jesus the first time, when he came as a baby, there are eight prophecies in the Bible about Jesus coming again, the second coming of Jesus. <clears throat> and um, today, what I want to do is I, I want to ask you to focus with me on a reality that's coming that all Christians profess. And, and in fact, that many other world religions affirm, and that is the idea that there is coming a final judgment, a last judgment. And as we get started, I just want to share a, sh a brief story with you. And uh, I I'm telling you this, this funny story because there's not much else in my message that's very funny, okay? So th there, were, there were two churches, they were across the street from each other. A Methodist church and a Baptist church, and uh, one day, the pastors from these churches, they were out in the front yards of their churches, and they were hammering signs into the ground. One sign said, <coughs> out in front of the Baptist church, <coughs> it said, the end is near. And the Methodist church, at the Methodist church, he was hammering his sign in, and his sign said, <coughs> turn yourself around before it's too late. So about that time, a driver comes by, he's, he's speeding by, he, he rolls down his windows as he's passing by the churches, and he says, oh, you religious fanatics. And the preachers kind of look at each other, and they see the car go around the bend, and they hear, they hear brakes coming on, and then they hear splash. The Methodist looks at the Baptist, and he says, I guess it should have said the bridge is out, slow down. <laughs> so, well... If I, if, I was, if I were making a sign for this message today, I'd say, the bridge is about to collapse, and so get ready. I'm going to give you information today about how to be ready, because beyond speaking a lot about the end times, uh, the Bible, when it talks about the last days, it points to the judgment of the world. So what does the Bible say about this? Well, the first thing that I want you to be aware of the Bible says about the judgment is that the, the judgment involves both punishment and reward. And that's important because for many of us, when we think about judgment, we just think about like punishment. God's going to bring a massive beat down on the world. And that's not all that's involved in the judgment. It, it involves both positive and negative aspects. 2 Corinthians 5 says it like this, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us 
do us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And so there's, there's two sides to the judgment that's coming. There's positive and negative. There's punishment and reward. So what else does the Bible say about the judgment? Well, it says that every person will face judgment. Every person will face judgment. Maybe you thought that because you're a Christian, you escape the judgment of God. It's not, it's not the way the Bible describes it. Look how, look how Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. That's, that's a scary thought. Or look at this from Ecclesiastes, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Everything. First Peter 1.17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, Live out your time as, for, as foreigners here in reverent fear, each person. The next one, the, the next scripture, Matthew 16, 27, Jesus is speaking, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Each person. Look, in Revelation 22, 12, last chapter of the Bible this theme comes up. Jesus is speaking, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they've done. I just want you to be clear today. I am an each. You are an each. We are an every. And so this applies to us. God is going to judge and reward each person according to their works. And so how how do you explain that? I mean, we believe that we are saved through grace. In other words, salvation isn't something that you can ever do something to earn. And and in fact, salvation is a gift from God. There's nothing you can do to like get it for yourself. So so how, how is it that we say that we're judged according to our works? Well, once we believe... We're judged according to our works. If the word judgment's tripping you up, then then understand that you're going to be evaluated with what you did with your faith. You and I, we're going to face a day of assessment before God. He's going to inquire about what we did with our lives. What we did with all the gifts and opportunities that he gave us. There's something else the Bible says, I, I, and, and I'm, I'm kind of getting at it right now, but I want you to be clear. Judgment is based on belief and behavior. Judgment's based on belief and behavior. I'm not, I'm not saying that you're saved through your works or that you're going to get in heaven if you just do enough good. But what I'm saying is there are two bases for judgment. In heaven, we'll be rewarded for our works. In hell, we'll be punished for works. There are two judgments the Bible describes. One's a judgment for unbelievers. It's called the great white throne, a judgment. And the second judgment It's a judgment for believers. It's referred to as the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, there's this place where people who don't believe are going to be judged and everyone will fail. Their, Their works won't help them to make it to heaven. Only only for those who have put their trust in Christ and received the benefit of his sacrifice on the cross, they're the only ones who, who end up getting to heaven. That's how the Bible talks about it. Look in, look in, look in Revelation chapter 20. This, this, ex, this kind of describes this great white throne judgment. It says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it and the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. 
God's, God's throne shows up and everything else just looks small compared to God at that point. There's nothing else that's going to take anything away from his spotlight. He says, I saw the dead, great, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Notice plural books. And he says, another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. By the way, this, this book of life, it has a longer title in, in Revelation 13. It's called the book of life of the lamb who was slain. In other words, as I mentioned, those who have taken the benefit of Jesus's death for themselves through faith, receive forgiveness and, from God, relationship with God through faith in Jesus, they, they're not going to, uh, they're, they're not, they're not their, their names are found in the book of life. But the rest are going to be judged according to what's in the books. And what's in the books, he says, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And he says, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades, that's, that's a word here for the grave, hell. They gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. And anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, there are all these books that open up, and that's, that's the deeds of everyone. That's, the, that's all the things that you and I have done. Or, and in particular, in this setting, there's, there's no description of anybody being saved. There, there's only a description of destruction. He says that anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is a description of a judgment that is only loss, only punishment. And so the people who are standing there at the great white throne judgment, they're not in that book of life. They're not, but they are having to give account for what they've done in their lives. Now I understand when you read things like that, this, this is, this is kind of, this is scary stuff. And in some ways today, I feel like a, like a doctor who's giving you a really bad diagnosis, and I'm just telling you the facts, but, but I want you to know there's good news today. There's a cure for what's ailing you. What I'm saying here also, something you need to know about the judgment and something the Bible describes about the judgment that's coming, it's not just that it's based on 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 beliefs and behavior, but there are degrees of punishment and reward that will be granted at the, at the judgment. Degrees of punishment and reward that will be granted at the judgment. So what am I saying? I'm saying a believer who, who, who gives and serves tells others about Christ, lives their life figuring out how they can bring the most glory to God, will receive greater reward than, than the believer who does, doesn't really do any of those things, but believes anyway. You might understand it like a video game. If you've ever played a video game where you, you get rewards and you're kind of like filling your, you're filling your bag with <clears throat> different weapons and different rewards along the way and you're trying to get as much as you can, you might understand this life and the judgments that to come, that's to come kind of, like, kind of like that. Now, and, and, and please understand, I, I, don't, I don't really understand because the Bible doesn't go into much detail about it. I don't really understand how this works, but based on what the Bible says, I, I'd say this to you, that an unbeliever who's basically moral and tries to do the right thing, you know, he, he works, he, he loves his family, he's, he's doing the best that he can, but he refuses to receive Christ, refuses to believe in him, refuses to trust him. I don't, I, the way the Bible describes it, I don't think he's gonna receive the same punishment as the man who's a murderer or rapist. That, that just wouldn't be just. 
What I'm saying is there are degrees of punishment and reward that will be granted at the time of the judgment. Now, I'm, I'm going to read to you a scripture right now from uh, Matthew chapter 11. I want to talk to you about, it's going to mention four cities. And what you need to know about these four cities is they don't exist anymore. They were all wiped out, okay? And including the ones where <coughs> that Jesus, were contemporaries of Jesus, which are Chorazin and Bethsaida. He says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon wiped off the map, they would, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, he's saying that he came to these cities, he did miracles in them, he, he, taught, he taught his message in these cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida, and they did not repent. He says, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. So it's going to be, it's going to be easier for Tyre and Sidon than for you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, because you didn't listen to my message. And he says, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, Sodom's not there, I think maybe you know that story. It would have remained to this day, but I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. So there, there are degrees of punishment in the judgment. Now, I don't know how this works. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how God's going to treat Hitler compared to your unbelieving neighbor, I, I don't claim to know any of that, but, but here's what's clear to me. There is a difference in the way that God will judge people in the next life, in the way that people will be punished and in the way that people will be rewarded. I want you to consider this. You know, Jesus said that you, he, he wants believers to, to store up treasure in heaven right? Well, the Bible also talks about storing up judgment. Not just positive things in eternity, but negative things in eternity. Listen, how Romans 2, 5 says it, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. What, what's God saying here? What, what, what is the scripture's trying to communicate to us. It, it seems to be communicating that, that it's possible through the attitudes of your heart, if you don't believe, to actually make things worse for yourself for eternity. Not just make things better, not just get more rewards, but actually to heap up more punishment on yourself. Now, like I said, I, I know this is a hard message. But this is something the Bible focuses on a fair amount. And, and if all the things, you know, that, that people say to me that they have questions about of God, they, they say, you know, what, what's gonna, will I see my Aunt Betty in heaven? And will, I, will, uh, will we be able to have our pets in heaven and all this kind of thing? I, I don't know, because the Bible doesn't really address that. But the Bible addresses this a great deal. And so, listen up. Take, take note. Now, I've been saying that here in this point that some people will receive a harsher, stricter judgment. You know, there's, there's a certain class of people who will be judged harsher than others. I'm one of them. Look at James chapter 3. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So I, 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 don't, I don't give this message to you cavalierly. I'm, I'm saying to you, hey, I'm facing a judgment that's more strict. I'm saying I'm paying attention to the judgment. I'm paying attention to the way that I live. And that's the thing. When you know somebody's watching you, 
you certainly behave differently. It makes me think back to when I was 11 years old. And my, my, my parents, you got to understand, my parents weren't fairly formal people. They didn't, like, uh, they didn't like double negatives. They didn't like the word ain't. I couldn't even say ain't. And I never heard, I never heard swearing in my house. But when I was about 11 years old, I had a friend. His name was Kevin. And uh, Kevin, he learned all these words that you can't say on TV, okay? At least you, at that time, you couldn't say them on TV. But so I, he taught me all these words, right? He's teaching me like every single word in the book. And I'm, I'm practicing them at 11 years old because I'm not, I'm not really, I've not really given my life to Christ. I'm just like, trying to take all that I can in. And so one day, I'm, I'm out with Kevin and these girls on the other street. We're playing kickball in the middle of the street, and, and there comes a disagreement. I run home. I am so mad, so mad. I run up the, my backyard up to the porch of the sliding door in the back of my house, and I open, I open the door, and I, I jump inside the house, and I, I hang my head out the, door, out the door, you know? And I live in this subdivision. I mean, you can hear, you can hear people playing ping pong next door. It's that, it's that tight. And I just, start, I just start releasing every single word that I've learned from Kevin on these people that I'm really mad at. Every single word that I can think of. And I slam the door and I turn around and there's my mother on the couch. <laughs> It was summertime. She was a teacher. I forgot that she wasn't home. <laughs> it changes everything when you know somebody's watching you. Our father's watching. Earlier, I talked about the great white throne judgment. It's a judgment for unbelievers. But the Bible, it also refers to this judgment seat of Christ. Christ. That's where believers will face judgment. And today, I'm encouraging you to be prepared. Paul compares the judgment of a believer uh, to the way that we might build a house. And he says, you can basically, you can build your house with cheap stuff, and it's going to be burned up at the judgment, or you can put costly things into your house. Look at how he says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, see these first three, they, they remain through a fire. The second three don't last in a fire. So he says, their works will be shown for what it is because the day, judgment day, the judgment seat of Christ day, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one's escaping through the flames." So in other words, you, you can build your life, you can spend your life on a Christian, as a Christian, on all kinds of things that are frivolous and that just kind of don't matter in the long run, or you can spend your life on things that will last, that will survive into eternity, that do reap eternal rewards. I can remember when I was a kid, we lived in an all brick house, and uh, when I was in preschool, there was a fire in my house. A lot of the inside of the house had to, be, had to be replaced, but the structure of the house stood strong. That's why people choose to build their house with bricks. Some people do. And what I'm saying to you, if you're listening and you're living for Christ, I'm, I'm wanting you to start making a list. I'm wanting for you to figure out what are the brick and mortar things of your life. How are you living your life in a way that will count for eternity? I'll, I'll give you some examples of things that are flammable, things that do not count for eternity and do not matter. 
How about a rant on Facebook? It doesn't matter. It won't last. A petty grievance. That won't last. Investing a lot of money in frivolous things. Those things won't last. Caring more about the athletic or academic endeavors of your children than you do about their spiritual endeavors. That's a flammable approach to life. And what I'm saying to you is we can either, you can either build your life as a believer with cheap things and worthless things, or you can build your life in a way that's going to survive divine judgment. So that's why, that's why, and I, I want you to be clear, the reason why I do a missions emphasis twice a year here at church, and I encourage you to make an investment for the next six months into missions, the very best kind of investment that you can, it's because that's about buying things, basically, for the judgment that will last. I don't know precisely how it all works, but I know this, when we invest in God's priorities, those things last. And when we don't, those things will get burned up. It's the reason why every Sunday I mention to you about the growth track. And I encourage you, if you've not done it, to go through the growth track because the growth track is about not only familiarizing you with this church, but it's about helping you to get in touch with your purpose and to find a place where you can minister to others and serve others because making a difference in the lives of other people that lasts for eternity, that's the kind of thing that survives this fire at the judgment seat of Christ. Your life needs to be, your life with God needs to be about more than just you. More than just you receiving comfort from religion. Your life for Christ needs to be about preparing to face Christ so that you have something of value to give him. I'm wanting you to hear today about the judgment day because I've got some great news. You get to choose which judgment you'll attend. You get to choose whether or not you're going to the great white throne judgment where everybody's lost and everybody is thrown into the lake of fire or you get to go to the judgment seat of Christ. You can choose what judgment you'll be a part of, but you have to choose it now in this life. And so how can you be prepared for God's judgment? Well, the first thing is, of course, to admit your need for God's grace. So many people I know, they don't, they don't want to admit their need for God's grace because at the heart of it, it's really just pride in their life that's keeping them from Christ. God's grace... <clears throat> God's grace not only brings rich forgiveness to us, but God's grace gives us the internal motivation to really change and to live for him, to want to live for him. Look how, look how James 4, 6 says it. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is where you start. This is how you get prepared for the judgment you admit your need for grace from God. You humble yourself before God. And you know what? God, God is thrilled to respond to a humble person. Another way to, to, to prepare yourself for the judgment, a second step is to surrender, surrender your life to Jesus' leadership. That's number two. Surrender yourself to Jesus's leadership. Now, <clears throat> the, the way that the Bible describes that, that this happens, is that I stop behaving like I'm living, like I did before I met Christ. I stop doing the things that I was doing that just pleased me, and I start living in a new way, where I'm trying to live in a way that pleases Christ. Look how Ephesians 4 says it. 
It says, you were, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, to put away those old behaviors, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new. This, this is what happens when I start to surrender my life to Jesus' leadership. I will start to change and I will actually start to want the things that he wants. Third, a third way to prepare for God's judgment is to trust that Jesus' righteousness is sufficient. What am I saying here? I'm saying that, that Jesus, he was totally right with God. And part of the way that the New Testament explains it is that when Jesus died on the cross, he, he gave his, he, he gives his righteousness to us if we'll put our faith in him. In other words, God will look at us as though we were righteous like Jesus. This is the way the New Testament teaches it. And so trusting in Jesus' righteousness, that's, that's a basic way to be prepared for the judgment. I shouldn't be living my life every day in fear of the judgment. Now, I shouldn't also be living my life as though the judgment will never come. But, but what I can be aware of is that ultimately, Jesus' righteousness, not my own righteousness, is what's going to make me, what's going to help me to survive the judgment. Colossians 1, it says it like this. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I wanna encourage you, Jesus really is enough for you. Now, if you've already done these things, I wanna ask you to consider today, if you've already, if you've already put your trust in Jesus and you, you've already started to live for him and you've already admitted your need for God's grace, that, that's great. So what's the next step for you? It's this. You need to start asking yourself on a regular basis, probably every day, probably several times a day, are you doing all you can to help others discover God's love and the cure for eternal loss? Are you doing all that you can to help others find their name in the book of life? If you are, what, what is it that you're doing? I, I tell you what I would do. I would make a list. I would make a list. Because it's easy to get lost in life. And imagine that happiness will just come from figuring out what makes you happy. And I'm saying to you, Start figuring out how it is that you can live right now that makes a difference in eternity. That's how you get, and, and then you start acting on that. That's how you become prepared for the judgments that's to come. I wanna ask you if you would, just go ahead and bow your head right where you are, close your eyes. Today, as you're sitting there, I, I want to speak to those who've not accepted Jesus. You're not living for him. I don't know exactly what brought you, brings you here today, but I want to plead with you today to accept Jesus Christ. We've all made mistakes. Some are worse than others, but salvation is a free gift no matter how bad you've been. Jesus Christ, he died on the cross to, to, to put your name in the book of life. 